Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'll just give ourselves a minute while we get, uh, we're still pulling in our first panelists. But thank you for joining us today. We're very excited to get this workshop going um, and have you join us. We, um, this is part of a series and a few of you may have been on the first one, which was very um, popular and was received well. We're looking forward to doing more of these with you. My name is Betty Ann Bryce. I have communicated with several of you. So by now you're probably used to or sick of seeing and hearing my name. I'm simply gonna be your moderator today. You have a really great group of speakers that will share a lot of important information for you. What I'd like to encourage you to do is to use the chat to ask questions. We want this to be as interactive as possible. I've asked the speakers to pay attention to the chat to respond to any questions that you may have as it comes in. Well, of course, we hope to do Q&A at the end, but we want to make sure that we're engaging with you throughout the process. So that is the extent of my introduction to you. I would like to turn it over to our first speaker. I'm going to ask John Gale, who I'm so excited. I reached out to him first. I asked him to join us today to really set the stage because our first workshop was a while ago, so it's really important to at least get an overview and an understanding of the strategies to combat substance use in rural communities. And I thought John was the, the right person to do this. So I'm not gonna do more. His bio is on screen, it's in your PowerPoints. Uh, John, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Betty Ann. If I could have you advance to the next slide. Uh, this is our, our work has been funded by the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy within HRSA. Next slide. And I want to start with my takeaway messages. And it's such a pleasure to be part of this group today. Uh, I've been working in this field for quite some time. And uh, I really think it's an important opportunity to begin to advance the issues related to substance use in rural communities. And I always like to start with my takeaway points first in the odd chance that I bore you to tears. So at least get a chance to hear my primary message <clears throat> that I think att attacking substance use, not just in our rural communities, but in, in across the country takes a village. It requires community engagement and involvement because I believe that these two sets of activities are central to addressing substance use. As we look at rural communities, and, and Mr. Kemp uh, identified some of those problems, substance use is very common, and it's very driven by a complex set of socioeconomic issues, some of which rural communities suffer more from more than other areas, some, not the least of which are the travel barriers we experience and isolation, um, we also have significant gaps in treat, prevention, treatment, and recovery services in rural communities. And as we uh, begin to develop interventions in, in our rural areas, we really need to think about adapting them to the geographic, resource, and cultural realities. Next, please. So some of the, the socioeconomic drivers of substance use, um, socioeconomic economic status, poverty, lack of jobs and opportunity, unemployment, cultural factors. You know, one of the things that we've always known in rural areas is there is a greater tolerance for uh, alcohol use than, than probably we should have. Uh, there are environmental effects and there are social changes going on that are really creating a sense of upheaval in, in rural communities. So next please. And so here's some of the, you know, the role of rural place. You know, I don't want to suggest that it's it's a terrible place to live, but because of the way of the way our economies have evolved, we have greater sense of stigma, that sort of lack of anonymity that people have. I grew up in a rural community, and if I was uh, being a typical teenager, my parents knew more about what I was doing than than I did, and they knew where what I was up to by the time I got home. You have higher sense of isolation and hopelessness, lower education, higher rates of poverty, fewer employment opportunities, and higher rates of chronic illnesses. And then you have very complex, we tend to think of rurality as a very homogenous places, but they're not. We have 
tremendous cultural, ethnic, and religious differences. It all have to be factored into this mix. Uh, next, please. So I, I've always proposed a public health model for substance use. It really involves community leadership, and that leadership can come from a variety of places. We need broad cross-sector collaboration. And I, I, I just have such great support for the role of faith communities, because these are often the central organizations that, that promote, that hold the culture of our communities together. We need data collection on, and to uh, address and identify the pro substance use problems. We've got to figure out what the risk factors are and what the protective factors are that can be enhanced and then develop a uh, prevention, treatment and recovery strategies. Uh, I think of them as three legs of the stool and then monitor the impact of what we're doing to be able to improve. Next slide, please. So this is a framework that, that I have been working on and developed. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on treatment. I'm gonna focus more on prevention and to a, to a slightly lesser extent recovery, but I think we are foundational activities I think that we need in every community, rural, rural communities in particular, is we need a community health needs assessment. How do we get our arms around the problem and understand what's going on in the community? And that means bringing in people from all walks of life and those that are suffering from substance use disorders and really beginning to think about planning and then bringing in community members because none of this can be done alone. A treatment program isn't enough, prevention program isn't enough. We need all to, to work together. And we need screening for mental health and substance use. And I part, part of that is in our primary care practices and hospitals where the providers and, and professionals screen for these problems, but be aware of the symptoms through and the challenges and the signs in all of our social organizations so that we as community members can begin to be more sensitive to it. And then we have prevention, uh, treatment and recovery. And recovery is interestingly one of the legs of the stool that gets often gets forgotten. And I, I think that it's important to reinforce the need always. And also want to say that prevention, treatment and recovery, it's not a continuum. These are things that are constantly interwoven. So next slide, please. So to me, one of the really important strategies is prevention. And the goal is to delay the onset of substance use, discourage or delay. You know, we know that some adolescents, for example, will experiment with alcohols. Generally, it's around 15 years of age or so, and their use accelerates as they get a bit older. And hopefully, as they mature, they, they begin to go the other way. So ideally, we discourage them from doing that. If we can't discourage them, we have to delay the onset. And, as, and if we, once they start, help them to figure out how to minimize high-risk behaviors related to driving under the influence, their, their behaviors, the amount that they drink. The goal is focus on children, adolescents, and young adults. That's where the biggest bang for the buck can be. Um, involving community organizing and education and figure out what the risk factors are. How do we address attitudes towards substance use? Um, and I'll, I'll, I see your question and I'll answer that in a moment. Um, substance use and stigma. You know, I, 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 the question is about whether or not gay, marijuana and cannabis is a gateway drug. And I, 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 wonder, I struggle with this concept of a gateway drug because if someone has, I think it's all, it's hard to say that marijuana alone isn't that. It is a, a predominant driver of going down a, a much darker path. I think all substances are a problem because it's not dealing with that. I do. I am concerned that now that marijuana is being legalized in many areas, that we have to begin treating it and thinking about it um, much more uh, the way we do alcohol, and and helping people to understand what the issues are. Uh, one of the other prevention activities I think it's important to encourage is provider is prescription drug supply. I know we focused a lot on opioids in the in the past five or six years, but I'd like to suggest that that's not enough. We should be thinking about uh, benzodiazepines and other prescription drugs that have uh, addictive properties. Benzos 
are uh, a much more common problem involved with many car accidents and, and um, issues than we think. We've got to start focusing on that as well. And then finally reduce some of the harms related to substance use. Uh, next slide, please. So we need evidence-based programs. They're out there um, be, to reduce substance use, delay initiation, and in, moderate risk and behavior, risk behaviors and harmful use and inhibit negative consequences. They're cost effective. The evidence I've seen suggests two to twenty dollars in savings in future health, social, and criminal costs for every dollar spent. It's an incredibly good way, uh, investment. It's got to be adapted to the community. Uh, and when doing that, there has to be an understanding of the basic parts of the intervention and the prevention strategy that works so that we maintain that fidelity and then bring in cross-sector community collaborations. Now, I know there are some very strong and well-regarded faith-based community programs, but I also would argue that another role for uh, the faith-based community is to be part of these cross-sector collaborations so that they, they have a role across the system. Next slide, please. A couple of models that some of you may have heard of. Uh, to, the first two are opioid related. The others are broader, more broadly based, but Project Lazarus in North Carolina it was developed by a local minister who was also the uh, ran the local um, hospice program, uh, was concerned about the level of overdoses around opioids and has developed a program that has been extended to every county in North Carolina and programs across the country. Project Vision here in the Northeast in Rutland, Vermont uh, has a drug market intervention program to reduce the supply of opioids and has really helped the community take back some of its neighborhoods. SAMHSA has its recovery oriented systems of care and the community care the programs. And there are others. So next slide, please. I won't spend much time on this uh, on treatment because it's a little beyond, I, I think, this session. But I do want to reinforce the fact that um, it's an important area to work on and the community has a role. OK, I, Betty, and I will be very quick. I apologize. Um, but substance use is a chronic relapsing disease. And so it needs that opportunity to develop interventions along the way. Um, next slide. So the final area is recovery. Most people with substance use problems have burned way too many bridges. They've probably impacted their family, local providers, law enforcement. And what we really need is a an opportunity to give them a second chance begin recovery, which should start before, treat, uh, before treatment in many ways, or at least parallel, uh, address social rehab and vocational issues and provide a community to reinforce sobriety. Next slide. And here are the four dimensions of a healthy life that uh, has been defined by SAMHSA, health, home, purpose, and community. I think a, a perfect a perfect opportunity for faith-based communities to be involved. Next slide. I'm going to skip over this next one, please, as well. So some of the challenges towards implementing rural programs, you, they've got to be adapted to the area. Those that are imported from the outside, we, we rural folks tend to be a bit skeptical of others. Um, Community-based programs have to be sensitive to local, cultural, religious and ethnic issues, uh, what I call cultural humility and engage local leaders and uh, really have to support local living. Uh, next slide, please. And I, again, as I summarize and I will get to your question in a moment, sir. The community is key. Development and implementation of community coalitions are critical engaging business providers, uh, faith-based communities, residents, law enforcement. Uh, we need broad-based education on the dangers of substance use, and we need to work within existing programs to avoid reinventing the wheel and building local systems. So let me, uh, I, if I understand the question, 
Um, the first question, which is, are we, am I considering the capacity of faith-based institutions? Yes. I believe there's a need to provide greater education and that from community to community, that at level and capacity and experience is necessary to, uh, to bring the capacity and level up. Uh, I know many faith, faith leaders are users of substance and hide it, but I think that's where we need to pull this out of the shadows. Okay, and I will respond in a, a chat. I'm sorry, Betty Ann. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, John. Um, I want to turn, just go directly to Dr. Christopher Jones. I'm very excited that he was able to join us today. His bio is on the screen. And Chris is going to talk to us about prevention, adverse childhood experiences, protection and risk factors, which John alluded to, which um, Dr. Jones will do a great job of kind of amplifying and putting in context, because I do think understanding this dynamics is really critical to every to, to the rest of the conversation today. Chris, the floor is yours, sir. Sure. Thanks so much. And if you want to uh, go to the next slide in the interest of time, uh, keep going. Uh, and I do think this actually complements nicely um, what John laid out <clears throat> in his presentation. Um, but sort of stepping uh, back a little bit and really thinking about very upstream prevention, oftentimes people think about substance use prevention as like something you do in middle school. Um, but our view at CDC is that we can start even earlier. And really by looking at what we term adverse childhood experiences, some people may call this early adversity or childhood trauma, uh, but essentially ACEs are experiences that are traumatic uh, that happened during uh, childhood up to the age of 18. And historically, ACEs have been defined um, by different types of abuse, neglect, and household challenges. And that stems from uh, some original work from CDC in the 1990s, where they were looking at the connection between things like physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical, emotional, and neglect, um, having a parent or caregiver with mental illness or substance use in the home or incarcerated uh, relative or divorce or domestic violence in the home or parent treated violently. And they wanted to understand th these things that happen early in life, how do they impact later health risk behaviors and health outcomes? And there was a seminal study published in 1998 that found that these experiences uh, early in life have substantial impacts on the life course and the health of individuals over their lifespan. But as we've come to understand ACEs and the science has matured over the last two decades, we recognize that there are other events that happen to youth or during childhood that play out very similarly uh, to the more traditionally defined ACEs. So those are things like bullying, teen, teen dating violence, um, peer to peer violence, witnessing or experiencing violence in your community or your school, um, homelessness, death of a parent, really anything that can disrupt a sense of security or safe, stable, nurturing relationships in a child's life. Um, and you can really think of that as under a broader rubric of adverse childhood experiences or childhood trauma or early adversity. Next slide. And I think it's important to point out that these things are not uncommon. These are not happening on the fringes of society or the margins of society. These are happening in your backyard. Um, repeatedly, studies have found that about 60% of adults have experienced at least one ACE in their lifetime. And if you think about things like divorce, incarceration, mental illness, substance use in the home, it's not surprising that people would have experienced at least one ACE. Um, but an analysis that we did a couple of years ago, uh, published in CDC's MMWR, found that about one in six adults had actually experienced four or more ACEs. So again, that's fairly common um, and happening in communities across the country. And it's important to point out that the science is very clear that there is a dose response relationship between the number of ACEs and your risk for poor health outcomes or health risk behaviors like engaging in substance use. So the fact that one in six adults in the US had experienced four or more uh, really, I think, um, underscores uh, the magnitude of ACEs, but also the potential 
to reduce things like substance use if we address ACEs. We do also know that ACEs are more common among females, among uh, sexual minority populations, and among most race ethnicity groups. Um, next slide. So we've also conceptualized ACEs, and I think again, this sort of underscores some of John's points, that the traditionally defined ACEs are things that sort of happen to an individual or within a family dynamic. But we also appreciate that other things that are going on in the community and sort of the contextual factors in the community can contribute to or exacerbate ACEs. So poverty, discrimination, lack of opportunity, um, instable housing, violence in the community, community disruption are all sort of feeding in to stress in the community, stress within the family uh, environments. Um, and exacerbating ACEs. So as we think about prevention, we have to think at the individual, the family, and the community level when we think about prevention. Next slide. And as I mentioned, ACEs have lasting impacts across the lifespan. So impacts on mental health, maternal health, infectious disease transmission, risk behavior like alcohol and drug use, chronic diseases, opportunity like high school graduation rates, getting a job, having insurance, as well as other types of injuries. So again, there's this sort of broad spectrum impact of ACEs across the lifespan. Next slide. And next slide. And in the limited time that we have here today, I'm not going to be able to touch a lot on sort of the underlying mechanisms in which early stressful events in a child's life mold their brain uh, and their systems for responding to emotions, rewards, and stress in a way that predisposes them to engage in substance use or to have mental health problems. But it really comes down to the idea that as you are exposed to increasing levels of stress because your environment is unpredictable and it's unstable, you don't have enough food, you don't have a place to stay, there's argument, you're seeing violence in the home or substance use, your, your needs are not being met, um, basically your body goes on stress overload and we call that toxic stress. And that really shapes how the brain systems work together. And it dysregulates how people process stress, how they process rewards, how they process emotions, their ability to have executive thinking, coping strategies when presented with stressful events or problems. Um, decision-making cognition, and ultimately you have impacts on organ function. Um, and so there is reams of scientific literature that document the impacts of stress, but just know that it is essentially priming areas of the brain that would be responsive to substances and the rewarding effects of substances. And if you're not able to uh, typically uh, handle conflict or emotions, coping with substances may seem like a positive thing to do. And you're already primed to reap a higher reward um, from substances. And so that's sort of the direct connection between ACEs and substance use. There are also indirect connections as well. Uh, next slide. And this just gives a little bit of the sort of life course about how ACEs play out. So you have these early events in childhood that lead to disruption in the neurodevelopment, how the brain is functioning and the wiring in the brain and the systems in the brain, which leads to at a young age and in your sort of developmental years, social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, which oftentimes, again, leads to adoption of health risk behaviors, which again, you're, if you engage in smoking, drinking, substance use, other risk behaviors, that has a compounding effect on your risk for disease, disability, social problems, your ability to get a job, graduate from high school. So it's sort of a cascading effect that ultimately leads to early death. And we know that people who have six or more ACEs are more likely to die 20 years earlier than people who do not have ACEs. Uh, next slide. Next slide. So now moving specifically into substance use, and I'll try to go through this quickly. Um, this is data from the original ACEs study that was published in 1998. And I think the point here is twofold. One is that across different substances, smoking, alcohol use disorder, ever using an illicit drug, ever injecting drugs, P 
people who experienced ACEs had an increased risk for engaging in those substance use behaviors. And that risk grew exponentially as you experienced more ACEs. But even at one ACE, you're still at increased risk for engaging in substance use. Next slide. Uh, this is a more recent analysis from colleagues at CDC that was published in 2020, which just looks at the relationship between ACEs and misuse of prescription opioids, obviously something a lot of communities are struggling with and have been struggling with for some time. But again, the relationship is consistent. As you have ACEs and more ACEs, your risk of engaging in prescription opioid misuse is um, higher. And this comes from two different states, Florida and Montana. So folks who are rural, Montana's rural state, uh, you see that relationship. Florida, which has obviously large urban areas, as well as rural areas, again, relationship was consistent. Next slide. And then one area that my research has been focusing on over the last couple of years is really the resurgence of stimulants in the US and uh, great concern about rising methamphetamine use and harms, in particular, combined use of methamphetamine and opioids and what that stands to do for the progress that we've been making in the opioid space. This is a paper that was published recently where we looked at the relationship between ACEs and people who are using stimulants in the past year or people who had a stimulant use disorder or people who used cocaine or had a cocaine use disorder. Uh, the bottom line is that the vast majority of people who are using stimulants or have a use disorder have experienced ACEs. Um, and again, a significant uh, minority have experienced four or more ACEs. So as we think about prevention in particular, Focusing on ACEs, there's a big payoff if we can reduce ACEs. Similarly, we looked at the age of first use for stimulants, amphetamine type stimulants or cocaine, and consistently we found that people who initiated at a younger age were on average had a higher number of ACEs. Um, so again, I think it speaks to prevention that if you can uh, reduce the number of ACEs, people are one, less likely to use these substances, but also delay their use, which we know reduces their chances of developing a substance use disorder later in life. Next slide. Um, and it's important, again, to sort of point out the strong connection between ACEs and substance use. So these are would be the traditionally defined substance use risk factors. They exist at the individual level, the family, the school, and the community level. I won't go through all of these, but to note that many of them are ACEs in and of themselves or factors that contribute to ACEs. But thinking about, especially in the faith-based side, um, there are things around sort of community norms, community connectedness, uh, opportunities um, that I think faith-based help drive those community norms and connectedness in, in communities and can have a significant influence on that sort of community level, which does distill down into the family and individual dynamic as well. Next slide. And this just looks at protective factors. Again, there are individual as well as family, school and community protective factors, but things like resilience, self-efficacy, spirituality, um, being able to handle emotions, uh, having some sense of attachment and meaningful involvement in the community, family or school, providing safe, stable, nurturing relationships, positive behavior is reinforced, seeking help is a norm in the community, accepting violence or substance use is not a norm in the community. And I think there are lots of opportunities for the faith-based community to, and faith-based leaders to set some of those community norms and to help influence those community norms and a sense of connectedness. Next slide. Uh, next slide. And as I mentioned, we think there's a really big payoff for focusing on upstream prevention of ACEs. This is an analysis we did that was published in 2019 where we asked the question, if you could reduce ACEs, how much could you reduce various health conditions, health risk behaviors, and socioeconomic challenges? In just a couple of examples, we could reduce depressive disorder by 44%, heart disease by 13%, cancer by 6%. Those are the two leading causes of death in the United States. We could reduce smoking by about a third, drinking by almost 25%, and even things like unemployment by 15%, people graduating from high school, having health insurance. So there is a real public health payoff by focusing on upstream prevention. Next slide. And again, if we had more time, I could go much more in depth to this, but CDC put together a resource that we released last year, which essentially synthesizes the evidence 
for policies, practices, and programs that we know can reduce adverse childhood experiences based on the best available evidence. And they fall into six major areas. So the first is strengthening economic supports to families. The second is promoting social norms that protect against violence and adversity. The third is ensuring a strong start for children. The fourth is enhancing parenting skills to promote uh, healthy child development. The fifth is connecting youth to caring adults and activities. And the sixth is intervening to lessen immediate and long-term harms. And I would encourage you to go to that resource. It's not a long document, but it lays out the evidence base, sort of the theoretical connection be behind why foc focusing on different policies to strengthen economic supports can reduce ACEs or ensuring a strong start for children. But I think faith leaders will see themselves and the programs and services that they offer to their communities in many of these areas. Um, and there are opportunities to say, oh, Strengthening Families Program, uh, you know, that's a community-based program. We as a faith community could engage with others in our community to offer that um, to people uh, in our community. Or thinking about how are we engaging with, um, a family who is pregnant, who's not yet uh, delivered their child? Are we helping them think about what are those supports that they're going to need in those first couple of years of life? How can we provide that um, support to them? Or with youth, again, a sense of connectedness, a stable person that cares for someone, even if their house is chaotic and you know their parents are not reliable, they may find in their youth group at church um, or a Sunday school teacher uh, that there is somebody who shows up, who's consistent, who loves them, who can provide that safe, stable, nurturing relationship that can blunt and mitigate some of those effects they might be experiencing at home. So I would encourage you to try to find yourself in this document and see what you might be able to apply or things you're already applying in your work in your communities. Next slide. Uh, and this is just one example of a social and emotional learning program that has been rigorously tested um, and largely tested actually in rural areas um, that showed lasting protective effects in reducing youth substance use at up to the age of 19 for this particular study. But it basically was a combination of a school-based intervention, life skills training in seventh grade and strengthening families in sixth grade which again, found these long lasting protective effects. So there are evidence-based programs that you can engage with others in your community to provide that can be protective. And they're agnostic to specific substances. It's really teaching kids how to deal with emotions, how to discuss and handle conflict, the parent-child relationship, um, things that you're probably intuitively doing in your faith work, um, but this just sort of puts some scientific rigor behind much of that. Uh, next slide. And this is just uh, uh, a plug that we do have a variety of different resources on the CDC uh, violence uh, website where you can find different technical packages for violence prevention, the ACEs prevention resource, as well as some trainings um, if you want to know more and learn more about ACEs or share that with others in your community. So thanks very much, uh, Betty Ann and Kemp, for having me here. And I'll take a look at the questions in the chat. Thank you so much, Chris. And um, a number of questions came in for you. And if you have more questions, just indicate that you know, this, this is for Chris. Um, moving right along, and I'm very excited that I actually we arranged it in this way because Chris emphasized the prevention and thinking about the individual family and community level. And this is something that uh, USDA does very well through the program that you're going to hear about from Sydney Turner. Why I wanted USDA in this play in this particular role is because stopping drug use before it starts, they were nice enough to um, provide some evidence-based um, activities to our work and really focused on that focused on rural. And Sydney is going to go through with three examples that I think would be really critical and builds on what Chris Jones shared with you. Sydney, the floor is yours. Thank you so much um, for having me. Um, so as we all know, we've heard about prevention-based strategies should be a part of um, this comprehensive approach. 
uh, for prevention, treatment, and recovery support services in a continuum care to ensure the best opportunity for effectively addressing the issue of substance misuse. So implementing population-based prevention um, education programs is a key strategy to achieve positive health outcomes and promoting a po positive quality of life. And um, with all prevention programs, they should aim to promote protective factors and reduce the impact of those risk factors. Next slide. And so here at USDA, we do a lot with um, cooperative extension. And as you can see on the screen um, is our uh, land grant university or colleges and universities map, which provides the, the non-formal education and learning to residents and rural communities by taking um, knowledge gained through their research and education and bringing it directly to the people to create that positive change. And using the, present, um, the presence of cooperative extension enables um, individuals to access um, to free or lower cost educational measures um, like health literacy skills and physical activity, stress management classes and things of that nature um, to improve overall mental and physical health um, to include reducing pain. So I highly suggest you take a look at the slides and go to that link um, so that you can get in connection uh, with cooperative extension if you're unaware of it. Next slide, please. So, um, the evidence-based prevention strategies um, that are highlighted in an article that we um, provided some input, that NIFA provided some input in, um, was three strategies, um, promoting school uh, community university par partnership to enhance resiliency, which is also known as PROSPER. Um, that has three components. It uses the local community teams, it uses state level university researchers, and um, a coordinator through the land grant university. Um, there's also chronic pain self-management programs and a mental health first aid education and training, um, which is becoming more and more popular. Next slide, please. So the program that Betty Ann was alluding to that we administer here at uh, USDA's NIFA is the Rural Health and Safety Education Program. So in 2017, um, at the request of the president, um, HHS declared a national drug demand on the opioid crisis as an official public health emergency, as we know. Um, the, a declaration was renewed and has continued to be renewed because the, um, it continues to be a critical issue across the United States. So this goal, um, the goal of this particular program is to foster the life and empower rural residents to make informed decisions about leading healthy lifestyles through research-based educational programs and approaches um, implemented in the extension delivery model. Now in 2017, they did add a caveat that we were to focus on the opioid and continue, um, Congress has continued to um, provide guidance and um, funding for uh, focusing on um, the opioid uh, epidemic. Uh, but we do, we have this program prior to that, which also focused on other, um, other areas. Um, land grant universities are um, the only eligible entity, but you can subcontract out the institutions and organizations that aren't necessarily or that aren't eligible to apply as a lead. Um, we get about $4 million annually. Um, the maximum award amount is $350,000 and it's for a two-year project period. And the solicitation for this fiscal year, so fiscal year 21, uh, closed April 29th. So we are about to undergo the peer review process for that, but I highly encourage you to take a look at that link and get to know this program and reach out if you have any questions. Next slide. So through this rural health and safety um, education, we've been able to fund um, three, three really, really good um, programs that I really wanna highlight here today. Um, the Opioid Prevention for Rural Health Utah Youth through the PROSPER, which is one of the evidence-based um, strategies. Um, as you can see, they have a target population, which was um, their sixth grade youth and their families in rural, to prevent them from engaging in behaviors that would lead to substance misuse and other um, problematic behaviors. Um, the objectives for them um, to improve the infrastructure, um, increase the number of youth and adults receiving um, these evidence-based prevention programming models, um, and uh, the impact that it has on the, um, the community 
for this particular program, they were able to, um, so far their with their target population of sixth grade youth in Utah, um, 40 out of the total 40 for this particular county, I do believe, um, as you see indicated on the screen that 100% uh, of them um, were enrolled and have completed the programming. So that is a phenomenal thing. Um, and then there's also, um, there, yeah, I think it focused on three counties and um, students are, so students are receiving the lessons and these are working. This, these are um, 2019, I think, funded uh, programs. So this was the impact so far that it's had. Um, we'll continue to get impacts from them um, as they're closing out and going through their final year of funding. Next slide, please. Um, this is another um, another good one, and they actually presented at the National Health Outreach Conference just recent, just last week. Um, it's the powerful families, powerful communities partnering to prevent opioid misuse, and this is in North Carolina. And their purpose was to reach out into the community um, with information that focuses on building stronger families um, and having that foundation to. Um, protect those protective factors and um, reduce the risk factors and risk or behaviors um, and substance abuse prevention by building life skills and strengthening those family ties um, and focus on the health related impacts. Um, and as they partnered with a um, neighboring state, Tennessee, um, to um, improve parenting skills, to make healthy choices and improve those family relationships and empower families um, through community change by leveraging their support for healthier lifestyles within the community. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this last um, one that I would like to highlight is out of uh, rural Texas, which is a teen think smart um, approach to preventing opioid misuse in rural Texas. Now this particular program, I do believe was targeted um, specifically to 10th and 11th graders or just 10th graders, um, oh, excuse me, 9th and 10th graders. Um, and it was a multi-level community-based um, prevention strategy and they used two evidence-based components, which was the community mobilization um, strategy and the school-based prevention education curriculum, Think Smart, which is, um, what they were using to um, complete their objectives um, that are listed there on the screen with imp implementing quality um, through their uh, community mobilization um, strategy um, and their program effectiveness by decreasing um, the use of prescription drugs in ninth and 10th graders and promoting adoption and sustainability of their programs to develop those partnerships for long-term sustainability. Um, next slide, please. Um, so all in all, in consideration um, from the terms or, or how NIFA and how we look at it, some action steps for success and things for you to consider when um, implementing evidence-based strategies are make prevention the priority at a local community level, make collaboration key. We all know that um, you, you can't, um, one person is not gonna, and focusing on one act, one, um, excuse me, one avenue um, is not going to make the difference, but um, involving the community, engaging in parents and caregivers, um, understanding the impact, and also partnering with the local cooperative extension team is highly, highly, highly recommended um, for um, successful um, evidence-based implementation of programming, especially to receive uh, low cost or free materials and things of that nature. So those are what I wanted to highlight here today from um, the USDA perspective. And if you have any questions at any point, Betty, you can go to the next slide. Um, my contact information is there on the screen. You also have access if you want to reach out to the project directors to get more information about the programs that I've highlighted there today. You're more than welcome to do so. And I want to thank Betty Ann for the opportunity to present what we here at NIFA do um, with the Rural Health and Safety Education portfolio. Um, thank you so much, Sydney. And I really want to emphasize what Sydney presented is just three examples of a very large portfolio of grantees who have are doing amazing things on the ground. I really want your takeaway. Why I wanted Sydney to present is I wanted your takeaway to be you have partners in your backyard. You may not know that you do, 
but you do. And those partners are the corporate extension and they are your local land grants. These are the folks that need to go out, access these resources and then subcontract out potentially to partners who are listening in today who didn't realize that maybe your university didn't go after this opportunity. And maybe your, if your university did, you could subcontract with them, build a partnership and then go on to kind of introduce some of these uh, protective factors that Sydney really highlights. So I would love to encourage you to connect with Sydney to learn more about who are the potential grantees in your backyard and then continue that conversation offline. Of course, ask Sydney some questions. If you have a question for her, just say, Sydney, this is for you. She will be monitoring the chat if she wants to share more information. I'm gonna go quickly. Now you've heard from kind of our overarching, and I do apologize, but it was so important, leading into someone who I know uses time very well, Dr. Monty Burks, and he is going to, um, as the leader of faith-based initiatives, he knows very well um, how to bring everything you've just er heard into the faith community. So he's going to set this up by focusing on two pillars, which is how to help the faith community identify their role and how to connect to the prevention resources in your backyard. Monty, the floor is yours. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And I can personally say um, that I, I can attest to the fact and the significance of the timeless prevention work of our substance abuse prevention coalitions in the community. Uh, enigmatic, difficult, pragmatic, community-based partnerships. Uh, that's how we flourish in our rural communities. Uh, we're gonna take a different approach on this. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Right here. Uh, we're going to, one more, back one, yes. We're going to take a little different approach on this. We're going to talk about how we mobilized and pulled in faith communities to have these uh, unique conversations around prevention, treatment, and recovery. Uh, one thing that the faith community can do that a lot of other communities can't do is they can attach to a continuum anywhere in the continuum. Prevention, treatment, recovery, criminal justice, the faith community can attach on each level with an institution as well as an individual, uh, depending on what an individual's preference is. Uh, I'm a person with lived experience. I uh, suffered from substance use disorder and a mental health diagnosis. I'm 21 years free from those, from those issues that controlled my life. And if it was not for um, at work through uh, the prevention coalitions that were in my local area, there wouldn't have been a mobilized community to connect the dots. Our faith-based initiative in Tennessee is very unique. We knew on the ground that we had to pull our faith communities in from an organic space, organic level to where they wanted to attach um, to other already defined institutions. And let me th throw something at you really quick. Uh, Faith-based institutions, as we continue to refer to, we also consistently need for resources. They have been around since before any single one of our institutions that you and I work for, they've been here since before us and they will be here when we're gone. So we need to strategically equip them with the capacity to handle any issue that comes their way pre and post us. We are the moving pieces in this, in this puzzle. Our Tennessee Community Faith-Based Initiative was designed to connect our faith community to, to our prevention coalitions, our recovery courts, known as drug courts in some states, treatment programs, jails and prisons, recovery programs, and our Lifeline Peer Project, which we'll pre present in just a few minutes. And to be able to be an access point for people to reach out and get resources. So not just prevention, treatment and recovery at the hands of the prevention coalitions, access to resources. Our prevention coalitions cover 12 sectors. The faith community is one sector, but it doesn't have to be one faith community in that one sector. It can be a robust network of faith communities in that one piece of that 12. Um, congregations willing to work with us in this space, we recognize them through our state department as certified recovery congregations using a trauma-informed approach. I love when we talked about ACEs earlier, um, Adverse Childhood Experiences Syndrome. I'm, I'm thankful for my good friends, um, Andy Clements, who I think is on here right now and the work they've done with the Holy Faith Collaborative in, in the East Tennessee Appalachia region. And our prevention coalition is working with us. We recognize an opportunity to engage in a conversation around prevention and early intervention. Listen, our faith communities are boots on the ground, whether we want to understand that or not, um, Sunday school teachers, people who uh, address children on a, on a very organic and natural capacity may reach someone and have access to someone well before we get to them. So we want to make sure that we equip them with the same resources that any other institution has. Next slide, please. 
So congregations who follow these, these steps here, we connect them and we certify them as certified recovery congregations and our Project Lifeline peers, our prevention coalitions and our faith-based initiatives, connect them to resources and ultimately help them to become the resource in their community that they didn't have when they needed a resource. So one, provide spiritual or pastoral support according to your congregation and your belief system. Again, cultural competency 101. We can talk all day and we can preach all day, but you cannot come in someone else's house and tell them how to do business. You can partner with someone. Make sure you do that through leadership with leadership's approval. Two, look at addiction as a treatable disease. Let's move beyond the language of moral failing. Again, not to come in and challenge what somebody believes. Let's partner with someone, figure out the difference between treatment and recovery and how it applies in this space, as well as prevention. Three, embrace and support people in recovery and walk with them on their journey. Again, we talked about faith-based institutions. Their original offset was fellowship in the beginning. They've been part of fellowshipping long before we were around. Number four, disseminate recovery information. Again, our, our initiative started as a recovery support initiative, but we drove the message through the prevention coalitions because of their unique, unique relationships built in the community. I love prevention coalitions because people don't wear suits every day. They wear Chuck Taylors and holy jeans and a t-shirt that says, I love you. That's how you organically approach and connect with people to do a great and masterful work. Five, host and refer individuals to recovery support meetings. Listen, prevention can start with people in recovery because they can be the beginning prevention process for other people when they leave programs and don't want to go back to where they're from. This is what we do here in Tennessee. We use this whole system, prevention, treatment, recovery, criminal justice, faith-based community as one continuum and continue the cycle and continue to connect people to resources. Now with that, I'm going to connect you with my two counterparts, uh, Jennifer Bourbon and Jason Abernathy, who work in the East Tennessee Appalachia region. And they're going to tell you about how we built an East Tennessee rural faith-based recovery network through this initiative. And thank you for your time. Next, please. <clears throat> So when Monty first came to us and started talking to us about this initiative, he shared the fact that we had over 11,000 faith-based organizations in our state, over 6 million people who live in our state. And of those 6 million, um, about half of them um, identify as members of faith-based organizations or congregations and attend regularly. And it got me to thinking as a prevention person, um, what would be important to bring them to the, both our table as well as the recovery table? Next. When we invited them, we were thinking about strategic locations. So congregations are located in every type of neighborhood crossing all the socioeconomic classes. Uh, the congregations are protected by the citizens in the communities, uh, whether they attend the organization or not. Folks are looking out for folks in their own backyards. Uh, congregations also have meeting spaces that people can use for fellowship outside of the regular service times of the congregation. Next, please. So we started thinking about what that overall impact might be. Um, you know, and we realized that when we look at prevention, it's important for people to know who's at risk. And we realized that there were around 3,000 people of faith for every person who dies by suicide. There are around 2,000 people of faith for every one person who dies from an overdose. And there are around eight people of faith for every person who are needing but not receiving treatment. You know, with prevention, we want people to understand what the need is and why we need to prevent those things. Next. So Dr. Burks mentioned the Lifeline Peer Project. It was established in 2013. And the idea being to reduce stigma related to the disease of addiction and increase community support for those uh, policies and for support for those policies that provide for treatment and recovery services. So with Lifeline and part of what I do or have done over the last several years is establish evidence-based addiction and recovery programs, uh, I've done educational presentations for civic groups, faith-based organizations, community leaders. You know, we want to increase the understanding of the disease of addiction and support for recovery strategies. We want folks to see it not just as a moral failing, but you know, we're, we're looking at sick people that need to get well, not bad people trying to be good. Um, we also want to facilitate access to treatment and recovery support amongst diverse communities. So a lot of what we do at Lifeline is we help folks, we direct folks into treatment and do those warm handoffs to get them plugged in to the services that they need. Uh, next, please. And the Lifeline, um, or the Lifeline Peer Project is based in our coalitions. 
um, because we, it made sense for us to be there because we, um, in our state, we have 52 abuse prevention um, coalitions. Um, we bring together people and organizations and leverage resources. So we're used to trying to connect people as well as educate people and make them aware and understand um, what, you know, different things. Um, and we have um, the deep connections to the local community and we to re and serve as catalysts to reduce substance use locally, as well as the abuse rates. Next. So Inside Alliance, we are located up in the Northeast uh, corner of the state the, in red, um, where the orange in the middle with the star. Um, of course, we focus on prescription drugs, alcohol, tobacco, and we're about to start uh, another program focusing on stimulants. Um, we saw it, um, the face sector is already a partner for prevention. It's one of the 12 sectors that we um, get involved with. Our coalition, um, when we were meeting in person, actually meets at a church. And um, to see some of those examples and those documents, if you go to our website, insidealliance.org um, and click on the Lifeline tab, you'll see faith-based recovery network information. But we saw it as a great opportunity to make some further connections. Next. So with the faith-based recovery network, we wanna utilize the prevention coalition as the driving mechanism. Again, there's such deep roots with these coalitions throughout the region. Uh, we had five main goals. We wanted folks in, in the recovery um, communities and in these forums to understand recovery. We want them to understand access to community resources, uh, building those stronger community partnerships. They can come on board with us here at the coalition and also with me with Lifeline. Um, again, connecting to myself here in this region as a Lifeline Peer Project Coordinator. And also, you know, just pulling in congregations as partners. There's a lot of folks out there in the in the faith community. They want to help. They just need some direction. You know, they can come to us, and we can kind of help provide that direction and get them plugged in to the different service opportunities that may be out there. Next, please. So, when you look at this little the little puzzle pieces here, you know, we want to connect the faith community to treatment and recovery programs and resources. You know, those things are out there. We just want to educate folks on how to get plugged into those, and also connecting the faith community to prevention coalitions. Again, all the the deep roots through the coalitions, um, lots of things going on. And instead of reinventing the wheel and doing something new, let's bring everybody together, get them on board with us, and that way they can be help be part of the solution. Next. So we'll skip through these next ones kind of quickly, but basically um, we brought, we had more than 10 forums in our eight county region. We had over a thousand people attend around a hundred churches or faith-based organizations. And at the same time, there were some other events that were dovetailing. Um, Monty mentioned um, Dr. Clements with ETSU um, was involved with the Holy Friendship Summit, which involved Duke University, which brought in some education about ACEs. Um, Adoration was an event linked to East Tennessee State University, um, gathered a thousand, uh, their goal was to gather a thousand churches, um, which they um, gathered quite a few. And there was about 2,800 people who attended that event. Again, it was linking the faith community to the issues we have around substance use and giving us an opportunity to educate folks, reduce stigma, as well as get people looking at prevention. Next. When we think about partners, you know, we have our coalitions, all the coalitions in this region, you know, we work well together. Uh, the Lifeline Peer Project, again, where I serve the upper eight counties in Northeast Tennessee, I work closely with all the coalitions. Our development district, our workforce is so important just because there's so many folks in the workforce who are, who are affected by addiction or who, who struggle or suffer with an addiction. You know, we saw them as being key. Our regional healthcare system, and then other community resource providers, you know, we don't want to just see folks go to treatment. We want to see them get the wraparound services that they need. So when they come out of, of whether it be residential treatment or intensive outpatient, they have that support. So, you know, when they come, when they come out, they, they can hit the ground running and have people around them there to support them. Next. And so coalitions do what coalitions do best. We um, hit the social media. We got people to invite their peers, um, old fashioned one by one, just calling, contacting people. 
Um, we did it in the evening so that lay leaders who work can come. I think somebody mentioned that, that a lot of folks, um, that their faith, um, being faith providers are not just one job, they have other jobs. So doing it in the evening so we could get the most um, amount of people involved and got food donations or love offerings um, but for two, food provided by the church. And we did it town hall meeting style where there, we had evaluation feedback, let people ask questions and really helped the, us understand where they were at and what they needed from us. Next. So when we talk about who was there for some of these town halls, it, it was not just churches. You know, we, we targeted paid and lay leaders, so not just the pastors, but other folks that serve within the church, uh, the different community or neighborhood organizations. And we wanted to get those folks involved because when it's in their backyard, you know, they got a, they got a vested interest in it. So we wanted to bring them on board. You know, other professionals, uh, Dr. Burke said something earlier about the 12 sectors, and you know, we have the 12 different sectors within the coalition. So trying to get folks, a representative from each of those sectors, whether it be law enforcement, education, healthcare, to the table with us. And then again, the community itself. You know, we want, we want folks to, to feel invested and feel like they, they have a say in what's going on. And, and, and it's also allowed them an opportunity to see how they can better serve their community knowing the struggles that are going on in, um, in their community. Next. And so what did we do while we were there? Well, we started off really basic. We called it the brain talk, where we talk about addiction, how it happens, why it happens, um, including all the things that have been mentioned today. Um, understanding the resources that are out there. That's one thing that was important that we put in the hands of everybody there. And that is that they know what treatment, recovery, and prevention resources are out there. Um, laid out what our expectations were, how do they apply. Um, we brought in examples of what other faith-based um, organizations were doing, um, and that served as being a place that they could refer to, or if they wanted to build their own um, recovery ministry or to add that to what their church was doing, um, they could do that as well. So like speaks to like, they were able to be a good example. And then partnership opportunities within the community as a whole. Um, again, how can the community support the church and the people that, who are attending? Um, and then there was just plain old networking and community building, which is so important. So one of the one of the key things, and it was in the questions earlier in the chat, and Jennifer just hit on it. You know, those that already have a recovery ministry, one of the things that was, it's been really great about these faith events, you have some smaller churches, you have some of those organizations that they don't have full-time staff or, or, you know, maybe they don't have the space. Well, we, we kind of broke down those congregational denominational barriers and we said, okay, we're going to put all these differences or, or maybe the way we look at things differently aside, what can we do to best serve our community? And and knowing that, okay, our, our small faith organization down the road we don't have the capacity but we can send them up the road here to this this faith this faith organization so those with uh, that already had a recovery ministry we we gave them some more education provided them some more resources but also connected them with other individuals with an opportunity to to help each other out to serve each other um you know the partners they had an increase in service opportunities through referrals there have been some calls coming in I'm able through Lifeline, if they call in looking for a, a house of faith or different things like that to direct them um, to where they need to be. And then also, you know, it increased the access to resources. So the faith community, you know, they received information, training. We've done some different things like suicide prevention, um, ACEs trainings, uh, trauma-informed care things to kind of help these, these folks to better serve the individuals who are struggling in their in their congregations or in their organization. And also uh, getting them aware of prevention and treatment. What we gained, prevention, treatment, recovery, what we gained was was volunteers, you know, folks to help us out. It gave us some, some meeting space opportunities and more partners within the coalition. You know, we're always looking for folks in the community to come in, you know, nothing about us without us. But let's bring everybody in this community and this area in this region Let's bring them to the table and let them have a voice and let them have a say in what's going on. Next. And it was great to deliver those resources to the faith community so that they understood what was out there and what was available to help those people in their congregation. 
you know, some of the benefits that we got as a coalition is the opportunity to introduce the faith community to coalition work, um, you know, promoting healthy behaviors, um, understanding how addiction begins, prevention, um, over, you know, reducing overdose, incarceration, recidivism. Um, I just glanced, somebody asked in the chat about, um, you know, what, what is our goal here? And I think it's all of it. We want to prevent it, but we also want to intervene. Um, we want to reduce harm. We want to um, raise protective factors, reduce the risk factors. Um, and so there's an opportunity for sharing prevention messages. Um, we do smoking cessation classes. We have information about underage drinking and social hosting, safe medication storage and disposal. We have data. You know, people want to understand how this is impacting their community and coalitions have that information. So the better um, understanding that people have of the problems that are facing their community. They understand the risk. They understand how it's impacting individuals, um, makes them all the more invested in wanting to engage in those prevention as well as protection um, and promotion of healthy behaviors. So next, I think that's it. Our contact information is on there and we'll respond to any questions you have in the chat. I think Monty beat you to it, Jennifer and, and Jason, but please join them in the chat to see if there's anything that you would like to add. I'm going to turn quickly to Pastor Greg Delaney to round out this conversation, providing the faith perspective by really zeroing in on the partnership piece and also showcasing an event, an innovative faith-based strategy. So with that, Pastor Greg, the floor is yours. Yeah, you can go on to the next slide. Thank you. It's good to be here with you. And I'm going to talk in Monty speed because uh, we're getting a little tight on time. But uh, really here in Ohio, uh, the connection of the faith community and to our community resources has been a priority of our governor since he was inducted um, and he was uh, sworn in. It was one of the very first things he did was create Recovery Ohio. And as a part of Recovery Ohio, one of the things that I do as a part of that group is work diligently to connect our faith communities to the work that's going on across all the different uh, spectrum, as, as Monty had described it, and Mar Monty and I partner all over the place about this stuff. So because we're short on time, I just want to go to the next slide. And really kind of what drives me is this quote from Pastor Tony Evans. It says the government can run and fund programs, but it can't love, it can't show compassion, and it can't embrace. And our faith, whatever that faith may be, it's designed to have social implications, not just heavenly ones. And so the spiritual and the social must be connected. And so what we spend a lot of time here in Ohio doing is educating faith leaders, inspiring faith leaders, inviting them to the table, showing them that they are welcome as a part of the recovery-oriented system of care. Then we find out what talents and gifts they have, whether it's a congregation, whether it's a faith-based organization, how they want to become plugged in and be a part of that, of that care for an individual across that entire recovery-oriented system. And so over the course of time here in Ohio, that's meant everything from starting a meeting in a church, to opening a faith-based um, men's recovery center in Akron, Ohio. So it's all across the board. But today I really wanted to spend some time focusing on a fairly new project that's underway here in Ohio that, that really shows how we did that, bringing a faith-inspired uh, program and a solution for prevention into the space of making it a community connection, including academia. And so what I want to do is if you go to the next slide, I want to introduce something called the good life. And on the next slide, you'll see Pastor Nathan Christman and Dr. Elizabeth Delaney, who I happen to be very close to, um, who were big instrumental parts of bringing the good life to life. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to them because they'll kind of fit those last two objectives of talking about how we can partner and then what was a new innovation around this partnership. So take it away, Dr. Delaney. Next Please slide. Go. Next slide, please. So uh, like Mr. Gale, I'm hoping that these are the takeaways you'll have from my part. And really um, we have, as I, I was an associate um, school of nursing professor, I'm also a nurse practitioner with background in oncology, palliative care and hospice. But one of the reasons that I wanted to get involved with this particular work was being a part of a person, as a person, uh, a daughter of a person who struggled with alcohol, who eventually led to suicide, married to my knight in shining armor who didn't even start drinking until his late twenties and having other family members who are struggling with substance use disorder, anxiety, depression, and distress. And if you look on this slide, those were our chil my children, our children, and my nieces, 
we're all part of the impacts of substance use disorder. So the first thing I want you to think about is when you think about your community and you think about prevention efforts, I want you to contemplate. One of those first C's for consideration is contemplate. In your community, when you think about prevention, who could be your people? Who could be, it doesn't matter your faith. It doesn't matter what um, you're trying to, to achieve prevention. So who might be, so just pause on who might be a person that could help in this effort. Next, do some checking. The next C is check out your community, check out your public health people, check out your faith-based and, and community organizations to, to, that are focused on prevention. Check them all out and then start to communicate. Because once you start having dialogue, what we found is one person knows another person and it's just basic networking. But if you have that objective of prevention or substance use disorder, then the person might have some common ground that you guys can work on together. Collaborate instead of create whenever possible. And so that's what we've, we found here is that this person knew this person, they had this effort going on, we had this effort going on, they had this expertise, we had this expertise, and ultimately we were trying to prevent substance use disorder, particularly in our communities and in the people that we love. Whenever possible, don't compete. So sometimes for whatever, money, power, greed, and selfishness, for whatever, whoever you are, sometimes those were issues that were not allowing that collaboration. So our experience led Greg and Nate, Pastor Nate, to be networking, communicating. They both knew people. I knew him. And Nate had started to work in middle school and high schools. So for us, when he started to talk to me about the good life, I was interested in increasing protective factors, increasing and delaying first use. I was interested in middle and high school kids because that's where we might have our greatest impact. So Nate knew of this, or Greg knew of this work that Nate was doing in the middle school and high schools. I, as a doctor of nursing practice, learned and, I'm, and have had a lot of work and in innovation and science as well as being a pastor's wife, being in both the circles of faith-based communities and very scientific communities. So how could I bring my knowledge as a doctor of nursing practice, as a scientist, as a person who's interested in evidence-based information to Nate, Pastor Nate, and say, these are all the things you're doing, but let's be sure that they are evidence-informed, that you are working together. So what happened is I sat and talked with Nate that led to a conversation where I talked with the IRB, the IRB at the Cedarville University. Cedarville is a Christian university, but I would tell you that likely, like we were talking about, Ms. Turner said, oftentimes com um, community extension officers, universities, they have people that are interested in your topics that are willing to come alongside of you. So that's what we did. We started to do a program evaluation of what was Nate doing in the middle school and high schools? And then what can we do to make sure that it's evidence-based? We then had another connection to a mental health and recovery board. And truly, quickly, we decided that we would just try. Let's see what happens if we submit for a grant. And lo and behold, we were, we were funded. So last year, the Good Life is under now a pilot program with evidence-informed as much as we know. We've surveyed students in one middle school and one high school our data is coming in as we speak, and tomorrow we will begin our formal program evaluation in hopes of being able to show this evidence-informed program. The, the initial feedback between teachers and superintendents was so positive that unbeknownst to us, the superintendent started talking to other superintendents in Montgomery County. We now have over a dozen schools that are interested in what happens with our evaluation and the fact that it's evidence informed. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Pastor Nate to give it, so he can give you a little bit more information about the good life. Thank you very much for that. And if you wanna to go to the next slide, uh, I have a picture of my family here. And this is uh, because you can go to the next one as well. All of us together, our family has been uh, intimately acquainted with uh, the effects of uh, addiction. And uh, we have just kind of dedicated our life as a family. When you go into our uh, ministry, as many of you know, uh, becomes a, uh, a significant part of your life where uh, things are centered around that idea. But as I've been in this space, it, 
I want to go to the next slide. Uh, what I realized in meeting people like uh, Greg and so many other people in this space, whether they be um, coinciding with the faith-based community uh, or outside of that, is we want students and we want people to be ready for life. And uh, as we learned earlier uh, in discussing uh, the A scores, there are so many things in life that we I didn't ask for, uh, but ultimately we weren't prepared for those and uh, we want to change that. And so as we meet with uh, uh, principals, superintendents, counselors, especially now coming out of uh, 2020 and now to 21 and all the things that we have all been through, uh, many of the, the conversation, much of the conversation is centered around the idea that our students need this now more than ever. And while I totally agree with that, my answer is always the same. And that's no, in 2019 is when they needed this now more than ever. Uh, and so we want them to be ready for life. And whether those are things that they're stepping into in their future um, that, are, that are great and bright and exciting, we want them to be ready for that and prepared for that. And in the same way, things that um, they didn't see coming, we want them to be prepared for that as well. And so we can find common ground uh, across uh, faith beliefs and across uh, those maybe outside of the faith community space um, that we have some things in common. That's we want the same thing for students. And so um, what, uh, what was shared um, so far today uh, is phenomenal, but my personal experience um, has been that often I have tried to create programs uh, and invited um, those who may need them to come to me and in exploring uh, how my faith works out in my own community, uh, not just as a, a pastor, uh, but as someone who cares about the community, what I wanted to um, do is go into my community and not just preach to problems, but really be someone who pulls for people. And so my goal is not to bring them into a program um, that I have created, and uh, this is the, something that I think will work, and try to invite them in, or even into our facilities, facilities or buildings. But how can I pull for people in such a way that I take this to them and make it ready, readily available for them? And so that has kind of become the theme. Now, if you want to go to the next slide, is that we deliver uh, support to teens, the critical support to teens, schools, and communities to see better outcomes for all. And so that became our mission. And so rather than kind of looking inward as we oftentimes do, we wanted to look at our community and figure out how can we provide the critical support that may be lacking. And the reality is, uh, next slide, is it can be difficult uh, making and keeping social emotional learning needs of students a priority in schools. And no matter how, mel we, how well meaning uh, teachers are uh, in, in their schools and how much they would love to do and how much of a need they obviously know is there, to support their students and come around them, the reality is it's very difficult. And so next slide, what we believe is that adequately, adequately addressing the life challenges that face students in today's world with the significant demands of teaching and meeting academic requirements is not something that schools should have to do alone. It's too much, it's too difficult. And we wanted to come in and figure out how can we uh, do this in a way that doesn't add something onto a teacher's plate. And so while there are many uh, just phenomenal uh, curriculums out there, there are many phenomenal programs out there, oftentimes the programs are uh, designed to uh, be carried out by a teacher or by the staff in a school. And so we wanted to figure out how to make it uh, simple and easy for them to do that. Next slide. So we wanted to develop, develop a partnership with schools that does not add any workload to teachers and staff. And so what we say kind of in, uh, in a short phrase here, next slide, is that social emotional learning, we want to make it simple and we want it to be done for you. And so our goal is um, oriented on supporting the schools and delivering the critical pieces that are needed for them to succeed to see better outcomes for students. So we do this next slide through our classroom teaching program, and we have um, developed a, a structure in a way uh, that those from the faith community uh, can become certified. And, and this was kind of a paradigm shift for me, by the way, um, and primarily through Greg and Beth here, is that um, there, there are so many crossovers between what the, the science community um, has to offer and the faith community as a whole. And so I found myself sitting in um, uh, prevention certification uh, courses and classes and trainings and thinking, wow, every ministry leader in the country needs to be educated in this way. And yet uh, those kind, that kind of education is completely absent from uh, seminary and college degrees and things of that nature, internships in uh, the ministry and faith-based world. And so how can we come together with those? And so what we're doing in our whole model is that we 
want to take the, the pressure off of, off of a school and we want to be able to come into a classroom and deliver um, the prevention-based curriculum for them. And so we come in and we teach in classrooms. Then we have a mentoring program that we're able to do and we've written a playbook that makes it easy. And again, there are many people uh, in a community and maybe many of your communities as well and your faith-based community, community as a whole through you know, business owners and things of that nature as well, college students who uh, want to invest into the next generation and they believe what we believe that the future and the keys to the future are held in the hands of the next generation. If we're not doing something now, then what will we look like uh, as a community, as a state, as a country uh, a few short years from now? And so how can we come in and mentor them? And there are many people who are willing to do that, but don't know how. So again, we wanted to make it easy. And so we're not providing a program and resources and hoping that people will do it. Um, in fact, uh, Beth had her number a little bit wrong there. We actually have 20 schools next year <laughs> in our community um, that want to do this. And so next year, we're slated to teach this to 6,000 students and more than 400 students are going to be going through the mentoring program uh, as well. And that's going to be a combination of teachers in a school, uh, in addition to members of the community and members of the faith-based community following a prevention-based social-emotional learning um, strategy for mentoring uh, that student. And so the work is done for you. <clears throat> also, we've noticed the need. And so we're uh, working to develop a sports leadership program because coaches uh, are facing the same difficulties and they're trying to teach kids how to run plays and win games, uh, but they're not really sure how to deal with all of the other stuff uh, that encompasses a player. And so we want to be able to help develop students who win, not just on the field, but also able to win in life. And then outside of uh, all three of these, um, a media uh, campaign, a digital community through uh, YouTube and online um, supports that kind of reinforce the values that we're trying to teach. Uh, all of this next slide, slide right now is, is based in an evidence-based framework. And uh, through the studies, we're hoping that the actual curriculum itself will uh, become a uh, evidence-based program. Currently, everything is evidence-based, and that's where we are able to, um, our, our curriculum is based on an evidence-based framework. And so being able to partner with the scientific community, with um, those in education <clears throat> in that way has been very, very helpful to us. And so there's more that we could share, but I know that we're running uh, short on time about the curriculum itself. And so uh, I invite you to uh, inquire about that, uh, share your, your questions, thoughts uh, in the chat. And I think our contact information um, is there as well, but we kind of span across uh, four factor areas of life. And this is just kind of in a nutshell, uh, but we talk about focus, friends, freedom, and future. And so the classroom curriculum uh, that we deliver on uh, behalf of the school and uh, the mentoring piece, it all follows this uh, four tiered uh, framework that we call the four factor life. And so the focus part is all about the inside you. And so we talk about um, emotional health and wellness and uh, how to overcome challenges and building resiliency in students there. We talk about friendships, which really applies to all relationships in life. And we talk about the idea that relationships can make you or break you. And so it's important to learn how to make and keep great relationships in life. We look at freedom and it's all about the choices that we make and the outcomes that those choices lead to in our life. And then future, the path of possibility where many students, and this is why, this is why we're all here. This is why we're all on this call and we're all in this um, in many ways together, even though we come from different backgrounds and uh, different ways of approaching things. But it's the path of possibility because we know that in today's world, many students, as a result of their past, they look to the future as the path to fear, as a path to anxiety, to a path to a dread and uh, just not want to even step into. But we want to uh, illuminate what is possible for students and um, believe that the way to do that, or at least a way that we have found uh, in doing that is not waiting for uh, students to come to us or waiting for the community come and be a part of our programs, but really um, evaluating the needs of our community and evaluating the individual needs of a school. And so there are many ways with our curriculum that we're able to do that based on uh, a school that might be rural as one that we're working with uh, in Ohio. Um, or they find themselves in, in another um, place in that community, what we're able to target things and tailor a, a custom made uh, kind of implementation method with each individual school based on their needs. So again, not getting them to conform to our program, but coming in and how can we support 
them and what we're all trying to do. And we want students to ultimately be ready for life. So thank you for allowing me to share today. And uh, again, I think that the real innovation to our uh, system here and what we're trying to do is to support the schools. And I think the best thing that we could do as the faith community is find the ways in our own individual communities that we can support and fill in and meet the needs of our schools for the sake of the next generation. Thank you so much, Pastor Nathan. Um, I know you're tight on time, but there is a question in the chat from Nancy Costello asking about the curriculum. So mm -hmm. just wondering if you could take a few minutes just to take a look and see if you had any responses um, regarding that. Um, and I didn't want to, I, I apologize, but I hope you found this conversation as rich and filled with information as I did. And I wanted to round out with something that is even just as rich and full of information for you. And that is um, the Rural Health Information Hub. And I would like to invite Christine Sandy just to share a bit about the prevention focused information that would help you. And I think it's really important as you've heard, um, just having that information will help you make some decisions today that are critical to where you wanna go. Christine, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Betty Ann. Uh, I'm glad to be here with you today. And uh, I'll share just a little bit about the Rural Health Information Hub. Uh, Mackenzie, next slide, please. So the Rural Health Information Hub is a federally funded information center on rural health. Uh, and we hope that uh, you will find it useful. It's targeted to uh, not just healthcare providers, but also uh, community members who are looking to improve the health of the population in their communities. So uh, you can find resources, information, data, uh, model programs, and funding opportunities. So I'll tell you a little bit about some of the specific uh, information you can find on the site um, related to prevention of substance use disorder. Next slide. Uh, so first is our uh, prevention and treatment of substance use disorders toolkit. Uh, and this we developed in conjunction with the NORC Walsh Center for Rural Health Analysis. Uh, and it is kind of a step-by-step -step, uh, in thinking through what you need to do to start a program related to substance use disorders. So it talks about strategies, model programs, uh, implementation considerations uh, related to, to starting a program in the community. Uh, next slide. We also uh, have a topic guide related to substance use and misuse in rural areas, uh, which uh, kind of gives an overview of some of the issues uh, that are, are prevalent in, in rural communities related to substance use, uh, as well as uh, resources, uh, statistics, uh, funding opportunities, uh, there's really a kind of a wealth of information uh, on that topic guide. And we also have a related uh, issue guide uh, on the rural response to the opioid crisis that talks about uh, what some federal agencies have done, what communities have done, uh, what opportunities are available related specifically to the opioid crisis in rural communities. Uh, next slide. And then uh, within our online library, uh, you can find uh, funding. And if you look uh, specifically for funding by topic uh, and the topic of substance use and misuse, uh, you can uh, find all, all of the opportunities that we have in our system. And we look at uh, federal agencies, state agencies, uh, philanthropic opportunities, uh, so there's really a wide range of, of opportunities available in that funding um, section. And so we, we give a little uh, bit of information about the opportunity as well as a link to where you can find uh, more information about those funding opportunities. Uh, so that's a really good resource. Uh, and next slide. And you can also uh, sign up uh, to receive information from us on a weekly basis in RHI Hub this week. 
um, or sign up for custom alerts if there's uh, just a, a narrower topic that you're, you're interested in or you just want information about your state. Uh, you can you can sign up for those custom alerts. And we also have information that um, comes through RSS feeds, if that's something that you use. And next slide. Uh, and if you can't find the information that you're looking for on the website, you can always uh, call one of our information specialists uh, through our resource and referral service uh, and get get information or get help finding the information you need, whether that's funding, statistics, you need an expert or um, you're looking for research, uh, get, give us a call or send us an email and, and we can help you find that information. Uh, next slide. And so this is our contact information uh, and I encourage you to uh, spend a little time on the website um, and if you, again, if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to contact us. And thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, you can go to the last slide. So with that in mind, I wanna thank you for your attention today. If you wanna learn more about, you can assume the next workshop in the series will be on connecting faith to recovery. No, we don't have a time yet, but we will keep you informed when that is developed. Otherwise, if you have any other questions, the, this will be posted. The contact information is on the slide for each speaker, but we will certainly make it more visible for you. A recording will be made available and any of the resources that are mentioned, we'll do our best to link to them on the website. Thank you so much for your attention today. And we look forward to engaging with you again in the future. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs>